Hi guys, um, I wanted to give you a review of Gothic architecture and finish up the Gothic material. I know you're devastated we couldn't have class today, but um, I think you'll find that this will be worthwhile. I hope so. So this is where we started looking at Gothic architecture. Um, this is the Church of Saint-Denis and it's where Abbot Suger tried for the first time this kind of spiritual experiment employing the ideas of who he thought anyway was Saint Denis to whom the church is dedicated. Um, he found this manuscript, thought it had been written by Saint Denis, and it talked about the kind of spiritual power of light and even talked about colored light and Suger wanted to incorporate those ideas in this new building plan for the Church of Saint Denis. The way that he did that was by adding in a lot of stained glass windows and we looked at those especially in the area of um, here we go. The area of the the apse end of Saint Denis, and you can see how much stained glass there is on multiple stories. And because he wanted to have this open area, much more window space to allow light to come in, and this colored light in particular, he had to come up with some construction solutions to the issues that Romanesque. Uh, architects had faced when they were designing their churches with, and using stone vaulting. And instead of the rounded vaults that we see, see in Romanesque churches um, that required a lot more sort of compensation for um, potential weak points in the vaulting by having super thick walls and those huge compound piers, um, ribbing, all of that stuff, um, with stain, with the inclusion of stained glass in Gothic cathedrals, what we see them doing and we see uh, being done here is adopting a new form of archway. And here we have pointed arches, and that makes a big difference actually in how weight is channeled um, down through the vaults. There's ribbing here and cross vaulting and you can see all of that in the ambulatory space here that goes around the apse. Um, there's compound piers but they're much thinner than what we see usually in the Romanesque church uh, and the whole um, space is just light filled and seems much airier and open. And you can certainly see that here in this view of the ambulatory. When we look at some of the huge cathedrals built during this period, um, Chartres, and, um, which is, I mean, technically the Church of Notre Dame de Chartres, is a wonderful example of that. It's a perfect kind of middle stage in the development of Gothic architecture. In it, we see um, several periods of rebuilding come to this fruition. There had been many previous churches on this spot, many previous fires, um, but it was an incredibly important church, especially because it held the relic of um, the mantle of the Virgin Mary. And so pilgrims came from all over to see this mantle. So they needed a large church. They needed a church where pilgrims could circulate easily and clearly it was also a real status symbol this church for um, this that would be appropriate for the status of the relic that they owned and would certainly encourage pilgrims to come and see the mantle but also to see the great achievements in architecture here and the labor force and the money that was expended on building this church by the people of the town of Chartres. In chart, we see the use of flying buttresses, and that's what you see on the exterior here. You can certainly see that the exterior of the church is getting more and more decorative, which is quite different from what we saw 
in, say, the early Christian and Carolingian, Byzantine periods, you know, it's where they wanted to really show that difference between um, the terrestrial and celestial by showing a plain exterior and a fancy interior. With Gothic architecture, we see a new concept, and it's the idea that the whole church represents God's presence on earth and that it should be, you know, suitably decorated on the inside and the outside so that it would look like the palace of God, which is certainly how they conceived of these. Just looking on the um, facade here of the cathedral, you can see that there are asymmetrical towers. This tower is built a little bit later than the other tower, but symmetry, not such a big interest for Gothic architects. There's this huge rose window, which as you learn, is a symbol of the Virgin Mary, which makes sense since the church is dedicated to her. Then you've got these three part windows, which also have significance. The When you see threes in Christian art and architecture, it usually represents the idea of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, these emanations of God. Um, in the ground floor, at the level of the portals at Chartres, we have tempana sculpture and sculpted portal surrounds, very similar to what we saw in Romanesque architecture. In looking at the interior of the church, you can see the importance of the pointed arches. Um, this is a much, you know, it's quite a large church actually. It's about 112 feet high, the height of the nave. Um, and that idea of height and stressing the height, you know, really enforcing that, that verticality of the structure through outlining it with these ribs is really meant to make the worshiper feel this ascent of their soul towards the heavens, right? And that idea of architecture reaching the heavens is something we've seen since the beginning of this class. Because of all of the stained glass windows on multiple stories of the church, again, you have to have a system to compensate for the lack of the you know weight bearing walls on the exterior, at least that the level of weight bearing walls in the exterior is compared to Romanesque churches. So pointed arches again, and the use of ribs, and they're using a different technique here, um, so that. It's, you know, much lighter um, webbing uh, is used to fill in the space of the arches, and it's kind of a double shell technique, so it's not so heavy. Um, and then you've got the ribs that conduct the weight down to the piers, the center piers, the piers at the area of the crossing of the church where the transept is, are really heavy, as you can see the um, piers that go down through the uh, regular, the, the rest of the part of the nave are not so bulky, but these are meant to really help sustain the church in its weakest points. This is the exterior showing these portals in the sculpted tympana, and we also looked at some of the jam sculptures here um, we saw these Old Testament figures that are very much still part of their column. They really mimic the form of the column. There's drapery, but it's still very much um, used in terms of pattern more than it is in terms of naturalism. We see that change, however, as sculpture continues to be added onto the exterior of Chart. And you can see in this example where we have the moment of the visitation that we're starting to see a return to some of the ideas of uh, naturalism that were, you know, the root of Greco-Roman sculpture, really at the heart of Greco-Roman sculpture as we studied. And so the drapery is treated quite differently here. The texture of the drapery really seems like drapery. There's gesture, there's psychoactive psychological interaction between the figures. There's a lot going on here. You get a sense of the body even uh, underneath the drapery of the figures here. So clearly a change is happening. 
in looking at the um, cross-section here of Chart, you can see how heavy these flying buttresses are. They're enormous. They overcompensated because they were very concerned about uh, the vaults falling in, which would have been a you know colossal waste of time and labor and resources, but also would have been something to really embarrass, bring shame to the city, which of course they wanted to avoid at all cost. Here's what those buttresses look like. You can see that because of this idea of the exterior needing to look like it's the Palace of God, all of the exterior surfaces become decorated. You have these different patterns. Um, you have, you know, colonnettes that are added on, different little sculptural motifs that are added onto the exterior. We'll see that develop more and more. So there's a huge difference in the kind of impression that uh, the church has on the Gothic viewer as opposed to the Romanesque one. Um, it's totally different uh, amount of light in the interior, and Romanesque churches are certainly not as tall as Gothic churches are, um, but really it's that concept of light that's so dramatically different, right? Because in Romanesque churches, they had to have those super thick walls and couldn't afford uh, window spaces to break up the stability of the supporting wall. Here's a view into the vaulting at Chartres. We already looked at this in class. Here's just an example of the gorgeous stained glass windows that we see in Chartres. They're you know, really richly colored. This is obviously a view of the rose window, um, and there are several rose windows in the church, again, because of that connection to the Virgin Mary. And in fact, here is uh, an image of the Virgin Mary. She appears several times in the stained glass decoration at Chartres, underscoring her, the dedication of the church to her, but also the relic that the church contained. Here she is. The next church we looked at was the cathedral at Reims. This is uh, a real flowering of the Gothic style. This is high to late Gothic um, architectural style, extremely decorative. As much wall, sp wall space as possible is dissolved into window space. The exterior there's so hardly any spaces of blank wall space. It's all decorated. And the, nevertheless, the impression of the building is one of great airiness and kind of intricacy and even fragility, which, um, of course, is kind of tricks the viewer in thinking that this is a fragile structure when instead uh, the expertise and engineering involved in the building of this church made it so that it's an incredibly stable church. Um, in looking at the interiors, you can see that at the Cathedral of Reims, also dedicated to uh, the Virgin Mary, that it's a much taller church. It's about twice as tall as the nave at Chartres. We see um, even more window spaces, uh, a much lighter feel uh, in the interior, in part because of the materials used for the walls, but also just because of the great quantity of stained glass in the church. You can get an impression of that looking um, towards the uh, facade. So this is you're sort of at the area of the transept looking down the nave towards the portal. And you can see that at runs because there's such an emphasis on stained glass, the area that had been um, solid sculpted relief in the tympana it has now been replaced with stained glass. So you have a rose window on the ground floor and one on the second story. And they're huge 
um, areas of glass. If we go back to the facade, in fact, I should point out that all of this is glass, so it takes that um, solid sculpted tempera and replaces it with window space. And you know, you have this real kind of melding of the ground floor with the upper story um, because of all of this decoration. It's just totally overwhelmed in decoration. When we're looking at the facade, um, the dedication of the Church to the Virgin Mary is made apparent through throughout this decoration, but especially in this area here where there is a scene where Christ is crowning the Virgin Mary as Queen of Heaven. So it's a large sculptural dedication of the church uh, and, you know, clearly is meant to remind the viewer of that dedication. See the difference between the Romanesque church, this is the Church of San Lazar, and that huge sculpted tempana, um, the sculpted trumeau, and then you had the rather plain door jams on the side. Instead at runs you have banded um, multiple layers of the pointed arch, all of this with little sculptures in it. You have that larger sculpted representation of Christ crowning the Virgin Mary. You've got sculptures that go all the way around and meld one portal to the other. Um, and these are, you know, large-scale sculptures, and we're going to look at this group in just a second. And then on this central uh, trumo area, you have a sculpture of the Virgin Mary as well. So we looked at this, um, this sculpture, these two sculptural groups here. Um, You'll remember at Chart we saw how columnar the sculptures still were in that early, earlier part of the decoration of the exterior of Chart. And here you can really see how uh, there's a move away from that. The angel and the Virgin Mary here really, in a way, still retain that kind of sweetness and elegance that we associate with the Gothic style. But you can see that the treatment of the drapery the gestures that are included here, the sense of the body somewhat underneath the drapery, suggests that a change is happening, a return of some of those Greco-Roman ideals is happening, and that's abundantly evident in this pairing of the visitation where you have the Virgin and Elizabeth, and they are dressed like Roman matrons. They are you know, very much in Roman um, dress and the sculptural style, the treatment of the drapery, totally Roman. And you also have uh, the figures in contraposto. So certainly an obvious return to Greco-Roman sculptural style. At Rennes, this makes particular sense because there were great examples of ancient Roman sculpture around for artists to be inspired by, but clearly there is a change in terms of the kind of ideas about deities in this period, and we start to see a return of the saints and other deities being shown as human-like instead of emphasizing how they are not like us. We start to see them look more like us again, which we saw was the way they were treated in the ancient Roman period in particular, and Greek period as well. In looking at the exterior, uh, with the flying buttresses, you know, you can really see the level of decoration involved here. You have multiple spires, um, you've got very fine uh, flying buttresses, quite different from those bulky buttresses that we saw at Chart. You have sculptures that are standing in these little niches on the buttresses. You have other little antifixes here. Lots of sculptural decoration. 
it certainly shows you the difference in the width and, and bulk of the buttresses between Chartres and Reims. The last example we looked at in French architecture was this gorgeous little chapel of Saint-Chapelle, the Holy Chapel, which was the chapel of Louis IX, who was a devout um, king, eventually um, made a saint, went on the Crusades, was a major collector of relics, and built this little chapel to hold those relics in. And he really conceived of this little chapel as a little reliquary box. Um, and that's certainly what it looks like if we compare it to other reliquaries of this period that are very architectural in nature and also obviously um, using really luxurious materials as, as Louis IX will have done here as well. We looked at the upper church, which is what you see here, the high chapel, and we saw how the window space completely takes over. There's hardly any wall space whatsoever. There are just these tiny little supporting rib um, elements. You know, no longer can we even really call them piers because they're just so fine um, and narrow and just, you know, really the essential of what was necessary to hold up these vaults. You can see that there is a blue um, ceiling. The, the um, vaults here have been covered in dark blue paint and there are little gold stars and that's meant to mimic the heavens, something that we've seen, uh, the idea of which we've seen many times this semester and is a typical way that medieval churches uh, would be decorated. The stained glass is what you're really meant to be impressed by, of course, and when there is a lot of light coming in, you really just don't even see the any of the supporting structures. It's an incredible place to be in and truly is like um, the reliquary tradition with these jewels here, just jewel tones in the glass, all of this gold. You can really see the connection, I think, between these concepts. gives you a better sense of what it's like to be in this space. It's about 60 or so feet tall, so a smaller structure without a doubt, and one that because of its size would require less um, you know, support, so it was easier to manage all of this wall space. We looked at um, Venice to see what Gothic style looked like looks like in Italy. We looked at the Palace of the Doge here um, and I explained to you how in Venice, since it's a major site for trade, an important naval fleet, um, Venice has a very different kind of situation than anywhere else in Italy because it's completely surrounded by water and this gave Venice some natural protection so that they didn't have to worry about exterior, you know, foreign threats like other places did. As a result, the government building is very open. You've got this open loge on the ground floor and on this middle floor, which we call the Piano Nobile. Um, and then you have this upper story here with these large windows. So just a much more open kind of feeling than we see in government buildings elsewhere in Italy from the same period. Venice um, has a different kind of governmental system than other places in Italy as well. It was ruled by the Doge and the Doge um, is sort of like a prime minister in a way. He's elected um, by the senators uh, that were uh, appointed and um, had a fixed term would reside in the palace for the length of that term. But, you know, there was a whole system of checks and balances in place, actually, with uh, the ducal government in Venice. The doge lived well, certainly, while he was doge and enjoyed 
that you'll remember this is the other doge, but you'll um, enjoyed this uh, structure as his residence and the offices of the government. You can see the patterning that's used here. It's this light pink and white pattern um, that goes across the facade and that certainly relates to um, the Islamic architecture that uh, the Venetians had been had seen firsthand, had been in contact with um, all I mean all kinds of places across the known globe at that time um, and uh, are bringing back those those influences, those artistic traditions here as a way in part to show off the great trade connections that Venice has much in the way as we saw Pisa did in their cathedral complex. This church uh, is a Byzantine church that we didn't have time to look at but it is connected to the Doge's palace and in fact served as the chapel of the Doge, but it's uh, an amazing example of Byzantine architecture in Italy. It was meant to look exactly like one of the churches that Constantine had built in Constantinople, um, and there are all kinds of connections here to that church with these kinds of domes and then with the gorgeous decoration in gold mosaic of the interior totally covered in gold mosaic, quite extraordinary. So we looked at Pisa already uh, as we were talking about Romanesque architecture and even then I mentioned to you um, that some of these upper stories of the baptistry had been redecorated in the course of the Gothic period as they tried to update that style and so they added on these decorative elements of these repeated pointed arches um, to update it really for nothing more than that. In the interior of the baptistry, a beautiful Romanesque space, there is this pulpit and this pulpit is what we're going to look at um, as an example of what Gothic sculpture in Italy looks like. Um, it was done in 1260. It's actually signed by the artist that made it, Nicola Pisano. And in this um, pulpit, what would the, the function of the pulpit is that the priest would actually go up a little ladder and be in the pulpit as he was preaching. This is the baptismal font, that little water well in where uh, people would be baptized so that they could then enter into the church um, in every sense of the, the word of that. So the, the pulpit is decorated in a way that absolutely um, suggests, just as the sculptures, at, um, later sculptures at Scharf and Ron suggest, that there is a return to Greco-Roman um, ideals in uh, style in art. In this pulpit, um, this inscription is quite amazing um, because what it says on it is in the year 1260, Nicola Pisano carved this noble work. May so gifted a hand be praised as it deserves. You can tell he was really, you know, had a, a self esteem issue. But what we see in uh, the pulpit is, you know, you've got these Corinthian columns, multicolored column shafts, may have been taken from um, Roman buildings or monuments that were around Pisa. You've got lions that are supporting the uh, columns on their backs. There are um, these areas of spandrels and obviously this rounded arch is meant to remind the viewer of the concept of the triumphal arch and these are like the victories that we would see in the space of the spandrel and these are repeated on all sides of this octagonal pulpit. I, hexagonal. I guess one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it must be hexagonal. Sorry. So in these larger uh, panels of the pulpit is um, we really see this change in sculptural style, but we also see it in 
these individual figures that are um, on top of the column capitals. One in particular shows something dramatic is happening. This is um, a sculpture, obviously, of a male nude, which we have not seen in a long time. And this nude male is in the stanza contraposto. And we think he's supposed to be either Daniel um, or a representation of fortitude. They could, those are not you know, mutually exclusive. But he also seems to show Hercules, who has the same attributes of the lion skin and clearly is the source for uh, this figure. So really quite remarkable to see this kind of directly and, you know, so clearly classicizing approach to the figure again. Whoop, let's go back. If we look, if this will let me, if we look at the panels here, um, you can see that the sculptural style is very classicizing. Um, and specifically maybe relating to that later classical period, maybe the Constantinian period, um, where you see figures that are more or less isocephalic and, you know, there's some hieratic scale being employed, but you still see the kind of classicizing bulky treatment of the figure and the treatment of the drapery is more naturalistic than what we see come, you know, after the, the uh, late. It seems to be a return to that. And in fact, next door to the baptistry is the Campo Santo, which we talked about when we were looking at the Romanesque period. And in it, um, there are sarcophagi that are from the Roman period. And these are clearly the influence for Pisano as he's putting these panels together. And some of the panels have been linked directly to specific examples of Roman sarcophagi in the Campo Santo. And Pisano just changed the iconography so that it would be less uh, pagan and more Christian. So clearly using those earlier examples as source material. All right, so we've talked about um, this idea of civic competition. It was important in France, and Lord knows it was important in Italy. And in many ways, it's what causes the Italian Renaissance to take place. The Italian Renaissance is a period that um, you know, that really brings Italy to the forefront of Western civilization, uh, a place that it had not enjoyed since the height of the ancient Roman Empire, and um, really changes a great deal of Western culture as we know it. This uh, idea of competition we certainly see in looking at the cathedral complexes of Pisa and Florence, which you see here. Florence is keenly aware of Pisa's greater prominence in the medieval period. Pisa was an important seaport. It had great trade connections. It's a very wealthy city. Florence, on the other hand, kind of struggled. It had never been a very important Roman city. It didn't really have that kind of glorious uh, past or even present that it could be very excited about promoting. So the Florentines just invented one. They invented a past um, and, you know, they went with it and it seemed to work for them. For example, uh, in the cathedral complex here, what you see is the baptistry. This was built during the Romanesque period, and you can tell that if you, you know, knowing what you know about Romanesque architecture, you can see the kind of small, repeated Roman arches and the kind of multicolored marble decoration. You know, you could totally identify this as being Romanesque. And then behind it, you have the cathedral and 
the tower, both, ele both of which we'll look at in a minute. What's extraordinary is that around the year 1400, you can see the baptistry was built around 1059 um, to 1150. But by the year 1400, and probably before that, they forgot rather conveniently that this was a Romanesque building. And instead, they identified it as being an ancient Roman temple to Mars which of course it wasn't, but they wanted to have this fabulous example of Roman architecture, so they claimed that it was. They also claimed that Julius Caesar himself had founded the city of Florence, and they, you know, just kind of invented all of these stories about the glory days of Roman Florence. A lot of the architecture and even the painting and sculpture that's produced in Florence from the late medieval period, so you know anywhere from 1200 to 1400, shows that there is this infusion of Roman ideals and this connection of Roman ideals to the very city fabric of Florence that will go even further in the course of the 1400s and 1500s um, when, you know, the, the two centuries of the Renaissance. So it's a fascinating thing to think about how those things can be forgotten, but we don't have uh, the space in this class, unfortunately, to talk about that further. You'll have to take a Renaissance class with me. But what I do want to show you is um, the Cathedral of Florence, which is very often called Il Duomo, um, is a huge church, a church that was meant to outdo any other churches uh, in Italy when it was built larger in scale than any other church in Italy when it was built. And the fascinating thing about this church during the medieval period, the late medieval period, is that they start building it. And they start it by 1296. And they start building this ground level area and they keep building and building. And as they get to this apse end of the church, they make an important decision. They decide that they are going to build this church with a dome on it. We've seen domes. We saw a very important precedent for this dome in Rome at the Pantheon, and that was absolutely their inspiration here as this great, you know, pseudo Roman city, re sort of in the process of uh, being born again. They wanted to have a major dome that was Roman inspired. The problem was they had absolutely no idea how to build the dome. They did not know that the Pantheon was made with concrete and they were just clueless how they were going to do it. But that doesn't stop the Florentines, sorry, that doesn't stop the Florentines. They decide that they will just continue to build it and they'll just leave this whole space in the back of the church as a big old open hole and eventually, someone, some ingenious Florentine will figure it out. They'll figure out how to build the dome on it. And so they swear, um, the, the sort of governors of the, the cathedral swear that every architect that they hire from, you know, right around 1296 uh, until the church is finished will follow the same model and that model includes this gigantic dome so they just went with it even though they were absolutely clueless about how they were going to do it the Florentines very typically very confident about their abilities to um, find a solution and as you can see they were right they eventually did um, right at the very, very end of the 1300s and beginning of the 1400s, there's a competition. Um, and this great architect, Brunelleschi, comes up with a whole series of solutions to the problems faced in building such a large dome. 
um, and was successful in pulling this dome off. But again, that's for a different class that will be covered in my early Renaissance class next fall. The tower that you see here is a tower that was built in the course of the 1300s and it was built after the design of one of the greatest late medieval artists of Italy, Giotto. And Giotto was an artist that came from the countryside around Florence. He was primarily a painter and we certainly today think about him more as a painter, but he also did mosaics and designed architecture. In the design of the tower, you can absolutely be sure that the Florentines had very much in their minds that failed attempt by the Pisans to build such a tall, narrow tower. And, you know, we, as we saw, it started leaning immediately in a just complete disaster. The Florentines build a tower that's taller, that's more narrow, and uh, certainly has this great vertical emphasis and it stands. Even more daring than that, there are these open areas um, for open window spaces that go all the way through the building. Clearly influenced by Gothic architecture as we've seen elsewhere, um, but still distinctly based on some Romanesque ideals and specifically in the case of Florence, um, is, you know, they're, they're keenly aware and, and, you know, really conscientious about having all of the buildings in Florence kind of follow this pattern of decoration of the dark green and lighter colored stones being used together. And they also introduce some pink here, uh, all local stones for Florence. So this great artist Giotto uh, that we think of more as a painter came uh, around in a period that was obviously receptive to these classical ideals. Before Giotto, this is what painting looked like in Italy. This is by Coppo di Marco Valdo, and it is a very Byzantine-inspired painting. It is very much an icon like the other Byzantine icons we looked at um, when we were looking at Byzantine painting. The gold background, this emphasis on uh, luxury materials, even the folds of the Virgin's garment are done in gold leaf. It's all about the luxury of it and obviously this emphasis on the Virgin Mary as Queen of Heaven is crystal clear here. But there's not a lot of naturalism, right? And as we saw, that's just not what these Byzantine and Byzantine-inspired artists are interested in doing. Cimabue is an artist that kind of starts to go in a different direction. And in this famous painting of his, the Madonna of the Holy Trinity, he starts doing some different things. For example, you have the Virgin enthroned with the Christ child. The proportions of the Christ child are still the kind of little man uh, proportions that we see in Byzantine art. You can see that the drapery folds on the lap of the Virgin Mary in particular are still being done in uh, this gold highlighting but you do start to see at least some indications of the knees and open lap of the Virgin, right? You've got these angels. There's some modeling of their skin. There's certainly color modeling in, say, the sleeves of their garments. You see the knees um, and thighs poking out underneath the drapery here. Um, and certainly in the conception of the throne, Chumabue is trying to communicate three-dimensional space. It is not done with, uh, you know, 100% perfection, but clearly that's the direction he's moving in. You know, he gives these arched lines, so semicircles that help us understand that this is... All right, not sure what happened, but okay. 
Um, so the next thing, if I can get it to move on, the next thing that we see happen is with Giotto, who was a student of Cimabue's. Giotto, um, in this altarpiece called the Onisanti Madonna, you know, we still see the gold background, and certainly the, you know, hanging on to the gold background, it, it stays for a while longer. You know, it's, especially in altarpieces, patrons seem to prefer it, um, both because it shows off how much money they've got, but also because it conforms to the tradition at that point for what altarpieces should look like. But certainly in other ways, Giotto's treatment of this standard subject matter is revolutionary. You've got the angels here in the foreground. We've got a middle ground area where the throne is, and we understand we have this background. We have all of these figures that surround the throne on each side. We understand that the throne recedes into space. You know, it's really quite convincing, this treatment of three-dimensional space. And I think my favorite element of this whole gorgeous altarpiece is the treatment of the drapery on the lap of the Virgin. As you can see, Giotto does it in such a way, using color modeling, that he really gets across the tactile qualities of the fabric on the lap of the Virgin. He really is using models, thinking about how drapery falls, how the light hits the drapery. And, you know, you can see other areas of this beautiful thing where, you know, you've got the transparency of the drapery on the Christ child, this gorgeous drape over um, the breast and torso of the Virgin. And looking at the angels, you can see that they overlap, and that sometimes causes problems, right? Sometimes that means with the treatment of the halo, as he continues to do it here, um, since it's like a plate stuck on the side of their head, that means the plate covers up some of the other figures, right? That's kind of a problem, um, but something that uh, perhaps his patrons demanded, or perhaps Giotto didn't see as being an issue. It's hard to say. With Giotto, certainly we see the great monumentality of the figure return. There's this kind of real mass and weight about his figure that certainly connects it to what we see in classical art. There's quite a big difference in the 20 or so years that separate Giotto's Onisanti Madonna with Cimabue's. Right, I think you can see that very clearly here. But Cimabue's strides are what enable Giotto to really revolutionize painting in this late medieval period. Giotto's fame becomes internationally known and he is commissioned by a patron who lives in Padua whose name is Enrico Scrovegni, to, to decorate the family chapel. This chapel we call the Arena Chapel um, because it was built at the site where there was a Roman arena, but it is also the Scrovegni Chapel, the chapel of the Scrovegni family. Giotto was commissioned to do this, uh, to do all of the fresco decoration for this chapel in 1305. Padua was a major city at the time, a real center for learning, an important university that attracted internationally renowned scholars. Um, Dante was actually around uh, and was probably an influence to Giotto as he was uh, working on these frescoes. This shows you um, how this is a drawing from the 1800s but shows you the way that there was originally a, a palace that was a, attached to the chapel sadly this is uh, another example of um, bombing and the destruction of art um, 
because the Americans tried to bomb the train station of Padua and accidentally hit um, actually the building that's on this side of the chapel, a major church that had very important fresco decoration, and it was completely you know, blown to bits. They've reconstructed it in part, um, but a disaster. But anyway, they didn't hit the arena chapel, so hooray. Anyway. So this is the interior of the arena chapel. It's a very small little chapel. But Giotto was commissioned to do all of it. So he did the painted ceiling decoration. And here again we see the blue background with gold stars. There are little roundels here where we see Christ and the four evangelists um, sort of poking out from heaven. There are these bands with painted decoration of saints, church fathers, etc. And then you've got these rows of scenes that go around the chapel and end here at the space of the high altar where you have an obvious use of the triumphal arch motif around the space of the altar, which makes sense as the altar commemorates Christ's triumph over death. When you're in the space of the arena chapel, almost at the space of the altar, and you turn around towards the doors that you came through to come in here, you are faced with this amazing scene of the Last Judgment. Instead of the Last Judgment appearing on the portal outside, it's now on the wall that you look at as you exit the building. And again, it's meant to serve as a reminder to the worshiper this time as a reminder on your way out instead of a reminder on your way in. In looking at the uh, scene here of the Last Judgment, we have Christ in his mandala, as we've seen him before. He's flanked by saints and the choirs of the angels, the elite, the saved, on Christ's right hand, of course, we have the um, saints and angels who are kind of accompanying those who will be saved. We have some souls coming out of the ground. They're still working their way out of the ground, right? And then you've got this guy here kneeling another guy holding up a church, and you've got these three women. This is a scene that shows us Enrico Scorvegni, the patron of the chapel, the priest who would, you know, perform the rites of the chapel, the model of the chapel, the Virgin Mary flanked by the other two Marys, Enrico is presenting this model of the Church to the Mary in exactly the same way that we saw at San Vitale in the Apse Mosaic, where you have the model of the Church of San Vitale being presented to Christ. Enrico Scrovegni had a lot of motivation for constructing this chapel and paying so much money to have the most famous artist around to come and do the decoration for it. Enrico Scrovegni came from a banking family. And specifically, his family um, had gotten a really bad reputation for lending mo money and charging exorbitant interest rates, sometimes so exorbitant that they bankrupted, you know, the person that had, had, lent the had uh, borrowed the money. Dante actually recorded um, that Scrovegni's father was in one of the circles of hell. Scrovegni was uh, clearly very concerned that he would end up going to hell because usury and this practice of uh, exorbitant interest rates and lending for lent money um, is a sin. And uh, Scrovegni knew it, though it's obviously how he got rich. And he's trying to make up for that as best as he can by kind of doing this grand gesture of piety um, in hopes that it will earn him either less time in purgatory or just a straight shot to heaven. So we see that direct um, 
that idea shown very directly here. On the other side, on Christ's left hand side, we of course have streams of fire, souls being tormented by demons in all sorts of ways. People are hanging, being tormented, being speared through, being eaten by this huge demon down here, held by one leg, getting ready, no doubt, to be eaten. You have this big serpent, dragon-like figure. People are emerging from the ground and find themselves already in hell. And we see that even kings and priests are included here as a reminder that no matter your status on earth, you can still end up in hell, right? That is an important concept uh, for this chapel. Something else that you should notice here is that the background is blue. Giotto is not uh, using those unnatural background colors, you know, even if he has to use them in major altarpieces, when he can, he moves away from them and shows us blue skies again. We see, you know, this more classicizing treatment of the drapery, of the figure. You have these monumental figures. They're not overly idealized. He tries to return deities to the human realm and make them more accessible to humans that way. This is just showing you the great contrast to what came before and also to remind you of the scene of the donation of the model of San Vitale to Christ. In looking at just a few of the scenes that are along the walls in the Arena Chapel, um, you have scenes that show the life of the Virgin and the life of Christ. And obviously, their two lives are intersected a great deal. In this scene, we have the lamentation. This is uh, the moment that happens after Christ has been taken off of the cross. He is dead. And he is being mourned by um, his followers and especially by his mother. And here she is holding her son, looking, you know, terribly saddened, Christ's body looking very convincingly dead with this grayish, greenish kind of pallor, and even kind of a sense of the stiffness of the body already. Giotto convinces us of the three-dimensional space here by doing something quite simple, but also quite revolutionary, and that is having figures with their backs turned to us. It makes it so we have a different relationship with the scene. We understand that we are mere observers, kind of looking over the shoulders of these figures in front of us, and it helps to layer this space so that we really understand the spatial relations between the figures. Something Giotto also loves to do, besides include these gorgeous blue skies, is give us this kind of infused, um, these elements of landscape, uh, landscape uh, that are meant to help clarify the composition. So, for example, this mountain slopes down and ends right at the area that we should then sort of follow through the Virgin's arm and arrive at the height of this dramatic scene. Right. We see the suffering of all of these people who are reacting in a variety of ways. Giotto is trying to communicate the range of human expression. Even the angels are anguished and expressing that in various ways. Right? You can see that in their gesture, pulling their hair out, um, so forth. The blue, you can see that the blue looks like it's kind of segmented, um, and of course it is. Uh, what, what that is are uh, the markings of the giornate. Do you remember when we were talking about uh, the good fresco technique, which these are done in, um, and how they would, the artist, just 
you know, has one section laid out that he would conquer in a day. Sometimes they would do several giornate in a day, but anyway, the idea is that, you know, you've got to have all of that area conceivably done in one day so that you don't have variations in the dryness of the plaster when you're applying the pigment, which would give you color variations that you wouldn't want. And just because of time uh, and the paint wearing down, we can now see those giornate, which would not have been visible to Giotto's contemporaries. This is another scene of great drama. This is the betrayal of Christ. Um, so in the moment of the Passion, when uh, the Roman soldiers have arrived and they are preparing to arrest Christ. And I just wanted to show it to you very briefly, just to get across to you again this sense of drama that Giotto is capable of conveying to the viewer. He's really a great storyteller. Here you have Judas, the coward, who has betrayed Christ. And we see Judas with this kind of beastly face kissing Christ. And that was the way that Judas identified to the Roman soldiers which one of these guys was Christ and should be arrested. Christ, knowing exactly what's going on, looks at Judas with great intensity, no doubt about it. Judas' clo uh, cloak here envelops Christ's body. That yellow is absolutely a symbol of cowardice, um, as it is for us today, um, but really adds to the kind of drama that Christ's body just disappears under the weight of Judah, Judas and this great sin um, that he's committed. We have Peter over here uh, who is in a moment of absolute rage as the soldiers are coming in and he gets so upset he just doesn't know what to do and he takes a knife and chops off the ear of this Roman soldier. Um, and we get a sense of the crowd involved here. This probably was much more legible in the time uh, Giotto painted it, but the silver that was on the helmets of these Roman soldiers has oxidized and now just looks like black kind of blobs to us, but would have been much more detailed originally. But you can see all of this color modeling, the treatment of the draper is just totally different from what we were seeing um, holding on from the Byzantine era. Along the bottom walls of the Arena Chapel are these different scenes of virtues and vices. And here I'm showing you two virtue figures. This is hope. And they're all labeled so that they'd be quite apparent to the visitor. So this is Hope who looks beyond her you know, realm and sees the promise of heaven above. And this is Prudence who sits and is diligently working. These are the two scenes I leave you with because this is my hope for you as you are preparing for uh, Jeopardy next week and uh, next week when we get back and then of course your final exam so i hope you have a great thanksgiving and i hope you will diligently study while you're at home and when you get back so that you can do as well as you can on this final exam i hope you guys have a great break enjoy your time resting and being with your families and i will see you when you get back take care bye